I want to express my thanks to uh, those who organized uh, this event, from everyone from Alexandria University and from the uh, Cairo Regional Center. Uh, it, it really, I, I know it's been put together in a short period of time. Uh, it so far today has been an excellent program. I hope I will come almost up to that level. Uh, but, and I also realized that, that we're late in the day. Uh, and, and so that puts some pressure on me, but we're lucky because I've got a really exciting topic. What could be more interesting than, than what I'm talking about here? Uh, and so I, 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 here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna provide a bit of a transition from Professor Spencer's talk to looking at the CISG and choice of forum clauses. Now, there was a reference this morning using the term choice of forum, uh, and that reference use that to mean choice of court. And arbitration is a forum, all right? So choice of forum includes arbitration. Now Gary Bourne has done wonderful things for us who study arbitration with his multi-volume series and his associates have helped a great deal. But what they did that wasn't so good is they used the term choice of forum to mean choice of court and arbitration to mean something else. And that's that messes up the English language. It's simply not the way, it, it's not good English. Uh, and, and so when I say choice of form, I mean arbitration as well as, as choice of court. I talked to Gary about that once and, and he said, that makes sense, I'll change it in the next volume, but he didn't. Uh, <laughs> so I, I want to focus first on the CISG and, and I too think it's a fair contract law. I think it's a good contract law. So I want to spend a couple of minutes to talk about whether or not it's a success or a failure. And Professor Spencer says it is an overwhelming success. Now I think it, it depends on how, how you look at it. It depends on the tests that you may apply. And uh, I think looking forward, we may want to apply new tests to see whether the CISG is a success or not. Certainly, uh, and, and I think these new tests will involve looking not just at applicable law, but applicable forums. And that's why choice of forum is, is important. Now, if we look at the number of contracting states, as Professor Spencer indicated, it's a huge success, okay? What other commercial law is the default law for transactions across the globe uh, between as many countries as this one? It just hasn't happened. But if we look at whether parties use it when they draft contracts, we get a very different story, at least in the United States. Every empirical study shows that when parties draft contracts where the CISG is otherwise the default law, they draft out of the CISG. And, and the reason they give is the same reason they gave uh, in, in the early 1990s, and that is, well, we just know our own sales law better. Uh, I, you will not give that reason ever when you draft contracts uh, because you're smarter than that, uh, because you will understand that that's malpractice to just say, I know this law better, because as Professor Spencer, Spencer demonstrated, there are issues on which the CISG is much more favorable to one party than the other. And if you choose your own law, you go to disputes and your party loses because the CISG would have been better. That's malpractice. That's not what lawyers should do. And we should worry not just about litigation and arbitration and how the CISG applies in litigation and arbitration. We should worry about the con how the contract is drafted. Because we as lawyers, if we're good at it, should prevent litigation and arbitration. Now, that, if you really want to be an arbitration lawyer and make your money doing arbitrations, don't worry, there will be enough disputes anyway, okay? <laughs> but we should encourage good contract drafting. And the real test of the law is how does it work for contract drafting, okay? If we look at the CISG and the development of domestic sales law, again, Professor Spencer is absolutely right. It's been a huge success, but this is kind of a backdoor spinoff success. Uh, that it has influenced the development of domestic law. So, in other words, <laughs> those who opt out and choose their own domestic law might be opting into a law that was 
created based upon the CISG. Now that's a kind of a neat result if you think about it, but that, that's a strange world, but it may be the world we're coming to. Uh, I think one of the greatest successes is here. How many of you will be with us tomorrow for the workshop on, on, on the best moon, right? The CISG, uh, the best moon was created now, now, most of the students who come out of the, uh, of the VIST moot say, I want to do arbitration. They don't say, I want to draft CISG contracts. But the CISG was created so that people would understand the CISG better. That was the initial reason for the creation. And then they thought, well, what? we could do a moot court. But no, we should do arbitration because there are other unsatural instruments we can bring into the game uh, on that. Uh, but it's been a huge success, and it has helped create the single most valuable pedagogical platform existence in the, existing in the world, the best move. Uh, so we have a collective record. We can look at it in a number of different ways. It's like the blind man and the elephant. Does that story still get around these days? It depends on what part of the elephant the blind man is hanging on to, uh, how you describe it, right? Uh, I think that we need to increase the likelihood of private party opt-in to the CISG. Uh, it is a uniform default law. It's a neutral chosen law. And it facilitates party autonomy, something else we've heard about uh, today. But then you get to the question, is that an economic equation for success, or is that, is that an economic uh, dilemma? And an economic dilemma means, but for lawyers, for a lot of lawyers, opting into the CISG has serious transaction costs. You have to learn more. You have to understand the CISG. Now, looking around the room here and looking at the age group we're working with, that's not your problem. It's more the problem of my generation uh, that has that. So uh, do we get global efficiency through global understanding? Uh, do we get single contract efficiency uh, by opting out and get it for, so if I'm a lawyer and I don't know the CISG, it's most efficient for me to opt out, right? Uh, if, if, but for the world, the most efficient result is for everybody to use the same law. But there's an inconsistency there. When you're drafting the single contract, you don't move toward what's most efficient uh, for the world. Now, I think that that for the large cases and, and in arbitration, uh, working in with the New York Convention, we, we've, we've got arbitration law that works well alongside the CISG. Uh, we have now, there are treaties that are completed, but not the number of parties you have for the New York Convention from the Hague Conference on Private International Law. There's a 2005 Hague Choice of Court Convention that creates a similar option for enforceability of both the choice of forum and the resulting decision, the judgment. Okay? And sometimes litigation can be better than arbitration. Okay? Uh, the, one of the, my colleagues in the US has called the Hague Choice of Court Convention the middle class case convention because arbitration can get very expensive for smaller transactions. I think that the future of CISG may be wrapped up in part in online dispute resolution, an area that really hasn't developed well yet. Uh, there are a number of reasons for that, I, and I think it's the private sector that will make the difference on that, setting up their own online dispute resolution systems, because when we tried at Uncetral uh, a few years ago to come up with an online dispute settlement mechanism and platform, that failed because of differences in legal systems. So, I think in some ways it's too soon to declare the CISG either a success or a failure. In many ways it's clearly a success. Is it an overall success? It will be when people start really drafting it into the contracts and opting in. Uh, but I think uh, part of this will depend upon uh, applicable form and the forms in which you apply it as much. Certainly in arbitration it works because there is a cadre of arbitrators who understand the sales convention, largely as the result of, of the Vismut process. Uh, I think that the qualities of uniformity and neutrality will continue to be extremely important in making uh, the CISG 
a, a success in the process. Uh, and so there is great hope uh, as we move forward. Now let me look more specifically at choice of form of the CIFG. And this is here where I think perhaps this, I hope that what I say will provide some kind of a segue into tomorrow's discussion of the VISP problem because it comes up. Uh, and here we start with two basic doctrines that are not substantive law doctrines, they're arbitration, they're dispute resolution doctrines. They're applicable in, uh, not just in arbitration, they're applicable in litigation. One is the separability doctrine, and the other is the competence-competence doctrine. Two fundamental doctrines of uh, arbitration, they exist because of the word consent. You can't have arbitration unless you have consent, uh, all right? But you must have consent not just to the sales contract, in the case of a CISG contract, or the general contract itself, but you must have consent to the dispute resolution mechanism, the choice of forum. And we separate those out for validity purposes, principally, uh, and that may mean that different law applies, and that makes private international law, it makes conflict of laws extremely important in the analysis of any problem that comes up in this area. Competence, competence, uh, plays in with this. But competence, competence really goes to the question of who decides a question, okay? It's not what law do you apply when you decide the question, but who decides the question? So when we look at the, the first the doctrine of separability, we see that invalidity or non-existence of the underlying contract does not necessarily entail invalidity or non-existence of arbitration agreement. You can have an invalid contract but a valid arbitration agreement, and so you go to arbitration to litigate, to decide the dispute over the validity of the rest of the contract. You can have an invalid arbitration agreement, uh, but that doesn't necessarily entail invalidity of the main underlying agreement. Now, I think as a practical matter, you're going to find that if you have invalidity of one, you're going to have invalidity of the other. But they have to be analyzed separately. Moreover, the law governing the question of validity of the main contract and validity of the arbitration agreement may be two different laws. And they may lead you to different outcomes. Okay? And you may have different form requirements. We had a, an extended discussion of the in writing requirement under the New York Convention uh, in an arbitration agreement uh, earlier uh, uh, today, okay? And that is that is a formal validity rule that applies to the arbitration agreement, the arbitration clause. It doesn't apply to the rest of the contract. CISG allows you to have an oral contract and it'll be valid, okay? The New York Convention requires that you have a written arbitration agreement, okay? Separability clearly plays in there, and you have different rules that apply to the two separate questions. So the second doctrine, the doctrine of competence, competence comes in. And we usually think of this doctrine as telling us that an arbitral tribunal has jurisdiction to determine its own jurisdiction, or competence to determine its own competence, right? Now, but that's not always true. <laughs> It, 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 the doctrine is simply stated, it's more complex in its application. If we look at the Unsatural Model of Law, uh, we see that it's a very simple application, okay? because this is the arbitration rule, which is written by arbitrators, right? There are people who like arbitration, and it says that the arbitral tribunal may rule on its own jurisdiction, including any objections respect to existence, validity, and other questions, okay? That's what arbitration law says. That's not what courts always say, all right? So be careful about that. Uh, the tribunal may have the competence to do so, but it may not be able to do so. And I'll come to some examples of that. And then they have, so you see here in the same paragraph of Article 16, you have not only the competence competence rule in sentence one, but the separability rule in sentence two, an arbitration clause uh, shall be treated as an agreement independent of the other terms of the contract. 
both rule through the same provision in the unsatural model law. But again, if you go back and analyze it, particularly from a drafting context, and you're drafting an arbitration clause or drafting a choice of court clause, there are five basic issues you must consider. Okay? The first one is consent, the existence. Remember, in unsatural model law, the tribunal has may rule on its own jurisdiction, including the existence of the arbitration agreement. Okay? Did the parties agree, if we're talking about arbitration, to arbitrate? The fundamental question. If they didn't, she don't go any further, right? Consent must exist. Second question is the question of formal validity. Is the way in which you express the agreement consistent with the law that applies to the requirements that must be met. Third question is substantive validity. Are there limitations on what you are allowed to do? Substantive validity is a party autonomy question, but it's a limitation on party autonomy question. Uh, and we saw earlier today a discussion of certain matters in Egypt that for which you may not be able to agree to go to arbitration. And most legal systems have those limitations. They may allow party autonomy, allow arbitration, but say, but not for certain types of contracts. Scope, okay? Uh, when, okay, if, if you've got an arbitration clause, what does it allow to go to arbitration? And are there issues that are not within the scope of that arbitration clause. And then finally, exclusivity. Uh, and here we get to the question of uh, hybrid clauses or asymmetrical clauses. Is arbitration the only place you can go? Can you go somewhere else? Sound familiar to the VIS teams uh, here? Uh, it is. Uh, so let's, as to each of these five basic issues, you have to first ask two questions. And here, what I'm, what I'm trying to do here is give you a framework. Okay? Because what lawyers do, and, and, and we, we don't like everybody to think, we like everybody to think that we solve complex problems, right? The truth is we solve very simple problems. But first we have to break the complex problem down into the simple parts. And when we get, once we get to the simple parts, the solutions are easy. So what we need to learn to do as lawyers is make life easy for ourselves, right? And you make life easy for yourself if you break the complex problem down into the simple problems. And regarding each of these five issues with a forum selection clause, there are two basic questions. The first one is, what law governs? What law do you apply to get the answer to any questions about the issue? And the second one is, who decides? Now the second one seems easy under the Montsatrol model law because it says, hey, the arbitration tribunal can decide every issue about its own competence, including whether or not the parties even consented to go to arbitration, okay? So let's look at that question of consent. What law governs the question of consent? Where do we find it, right? might sound important to this year's VIS arbitration uh, case, right? Uh, and who determines whether an agreement to arbitrate exists? Now in the VIS moot, the answer to the second question is easy uh, because uh, even after you've argued jurisdiction, uh, the tribunal moves on. <laughs> uh, and, and so you've got to assume the tribunal will decide that. But that's not the way courts have dealt with it. And, and you'll see that in, in the best mood, you often ar you argue arbitration issues by citing not to arbitration decisions, you do, but you cite to judicial decisions. Well, if competence, competence is everything, how could we possibly have cases that decide these issues? That doesn't make any sense. If you think about it, it's logically inconsistent, right? So let's look at this. The basic law on arbitration is the New York Convention. It says this convention shall apply to what? The recognition and enforcement of arbitral awards. Okay? Uh, now, 
and it's called the United Nations Convention on the Recognition and Enforcement of Foreign Arbitral Awards. But it starts with a rule that doesn't have anything to do with recognition of awards. It has everything to do with recognition of your agreement. It's the jurisdiction rule, paragraph two. And it says, contracting states shall recognize agreements to arbitrate. But agreements in writing, that's a formal validity issue. So we're starting to break down here the language to apply to the issues. And then concerning a subject matter capable of settlement by arbitration, arbitrability, which kind of falls into, you can create a different separate category for, for it from validity, but it's a validity issue because you can't have an agreement on certain issues. If Egypt tells you you can't have arbitration of a certain agreement, then it's not arbitrable. Okay. Uh, the court in Article 2, Paragraph 3, still at Article 2, shall refer the parties to arbitration unless it finds that the said agreement is null and void, inoperative, or incapable of being performed. Now that tells you that courts decide questions of validity. Okay? Uh, courts also decide questions of formation of the agreement. That's consent. But what happened to competence competence, right? Doesn't the arbitration law say the arbitration tribunal decides for these things? And the unsatural model law, where we find the rule of competence competence in Article 16, tells us in Article 8, a court shall refer the parties to arbitration unless it finds that the agreement is null and void. So Article 8, 1 says a court can rule on validity. Okay? Uh, and then, <coughs> arbitral proceedings may nevertheless be convinced and continued and award may be made while the issue is pending before the court. Which is interesting because you can have parallel dispute resolution in arbitration and in litigation. Now, Let's go to the consent question a little bit, and if we go to that question, we see that both in the UK and the US, the courts have said consent is a matter not for arbitrators, but for the court. And, and Lord Hope uh, of Craighead in, in the premium NAFTA case says if there was no contract to go to arbitration at all, an arbitrator's award can have no validity, okay? <laughs> there can be no competence, okay? So where the arbitration agreement is set out in the same document as the main contract, the issue whether there was an agreement at all <coughs> may in effect affect all parts of it. And if you think about this, if only arbitrators could decide the question of consent whether an agreement was formed, what does that do to access to justice? You've just taken away my right to go to court. Because if you and I have a dispute, all you have to do is say, we had an agreement to arbitrate. And once you've said that, what do we have to do? Competence, competence. The arbitrators decide, right? So you just take it, you unilaterally, by claiming arbitration, have just taken away my right to go to, our, to the courts. Can you have that kind of a system? Okay. The same conundrum works the other way. Okay, it doesn't, doesn't mean you should have to always go to courts because if we have a valid arbitration agreement, but only courts can decide it, then you've taken away my right to rely on your consent to arbitration. Okay. So we have, we, we have a real conundrum there uh, in the process. But in both the UK and in the United States, uh, the courts have said, look, it's for courts to decide whether the obligor ever signed the contract, whether or not an agreement to arbitrate was formed, okay? So the question of consent, at least in the US and UK, is when we ask what law, when we ask who decides, it's the court, okay? Let's move on then, formal validity, what law governs? This one's a little easier, and this is, this is good. And who determines? Well, this is pretty easy. Arbitration law governs, because both the New York Convention and the model law give us a rule. It's just that it gives us a rule that's troublesome in today's age of electronic communication because it says the agreement must be in writing signed by the parties. Okay, can that be electronic communication? Well, under the 20, 2006 amendments to the model law, the answer is yes, but the model law didn't amend the New York Convention, did it? And what does that mean uh, when, when you get there? 
substantive validity. You'll see that I'm going to leave some questions unanswered here. I'm not going to answer all the questions for you. Uh, substantive validity, what law governs and who determines. And this is where I, I, I like to use the distinction between arbitration and litigation because there is a distinction in the, uh, in the treaty. Article 2 of the New York Convention says that states recognize agreements to arbitrate concerning a subject matter capable of settlement by arbitration. What does that language do? Now, if you're in a government, what that does, if you're in a government, it allows you to unilaterally change your treaty obligations without asking any other of the treaty parties. Think about that. All you have to do is pass a law that says certain types of cases cannot be arbitrated. They're no longer capable of settlement by arbitration. You've taken them out of the New York Convention unilaterally, and states have done that. Okay? Uh, Europe has done that in, in its uh, directives and regulations on arbitration and, and the statutes that have come out of them by saying consumer cases cannot be arbitrated. Okay? Uh, paragraph 3. Uh, the court when seized of such a case should refer the parties to arbitration unless it finds the said agreement is null and void, inoperative, and capable of being performed. But what law determines the validity? And the answer is the New York Convention doesn't tell us. It's substantive law and it's national law and it's Egyptian law, if that's the law the rules of conflicts of law lead you to. That's why you have to understand the rules of conflicts of law. Uh, Article 5 which is on the back end, recognition enforcement of the arbitral award says, again, uh, you can deny recognition enforcement if the, diff the case is not capable of settlement by arbitration under the law of the country that is asked to. Now we have a choice of law rule in Article 5. We didn't have a choice of law rule in Article 2. You see the difference? Okay. Uh, and, and this is, but this is, this is back end. But those of you in the best mood, it's front end stuff. Because one of the arguments you always make on, on jurisdiction is what? Hey, if you do that, you won't render an enforceable award. And under the arbitration rules, you have an obligation to render an enforceable award. And under Article 5, 2A, this is not capable of settlement by arbitration under the applicable law. That of the state in which you might most likely seek recognition and enforcement. Uh, substantive validity in the United States. Here's an example of the United States opting out of the New York Convention. Not by statute, but by case law. Most of the federal courts of appeal in the United States have said that class arbitration is a gateway issue for courts, not arbitrators to decide. Okay? So the question of whether or not you can opt out of, most often, the class arbitration, uh, like class litigation, the class action cases in the United States, is, is for the courts to decide, not for arbitrators to decide. Because it's made a question of substance, arbitrability or substantive validity. Scope, what law governs, who determines what issues fall within the scope of a given arbitration agreement? What is that? That's simply a question of interpretation of contract language. What law normally governs Interpretation of contract language. It's not arbitration law. It's contract law, right? Uh, same thing with exclusivity. What law governs? It's a matter of interpretation. What was the intent of the parties? What rule tells us where we find the intent of the parties? It's contract law, right? Uh, who determines? Now, that can be arbitrators, okay? Certainly because you get, you've, you've decided first that there is consent there's formal validity, there's substantive validity, then you get the scope and exclusive validity. Certainly there's competence, competence for that. So you know that the who question is the arbitrators, the what is the substantive contract law. I want to give you a little bit of comparison here because with arbitration and litigation, if you're drafting clauses, choosing arbitration or choosing courts, it's a little bit different but basically the same because the 2005 Hague Choice of Court Convention, so far the European Union member states, including the UK, uh, Singapore, Montenegro, and Mexico are parties to that. Ukraine, China, and the US have signed but not ratified. But it's a little different, but there is one major difference. Uh, in, in the jurisdiction rule, 
Agreements to arbitrate will be honored. Article two of the New York Convention, choice of court agreements will be honored. But then the question of validity exists, it can get you out of it in both. But unlike the New York Convention here, in the Hague Convention, there is an autonomous choice of uh, law rule that says you apply the law of the state of the chosen court. Okay, now you don't have a law that comes with the arbitral tribunal, so you can't use that same kind of rule in the, in the New York Convention. Uh, Article 3 of the New York Convention, Article 8 of the Hague Convention uh, give you the basic rule that you recognize and enforce the decision with exceptions. Uh, we see them in Article 5 in the New York Convention, Article 9, and they look very similar and they include the validity exception. Okay? Uh, I, I'll go on on this one. There are states that when they, when they uh, ratify the New York Convention or the Hague Convention can choose certain declarations that limit their obligations. They're a little bit different, but I just want to wrap up here by, by looking at this. Uh, remember, their choice of forum clauses, there are five basic questions that you need to focus on. For each of them, uh, for one goes to the existence, the other four go to the effectiveness of that clause, okay? Even if the parties agreed, uh, have we limited their ability to agree because they did it in the wrong way or we simply don't let them agree? That's formal validity and substantive validity and then what did they agree to? That's scope and exclusivity. So, but existence is a matter of substantive contract law. You won't find rules of consent in arbitration law, okay? Validity, substantive law. Uh, and the New York Convention, I, I've broken it down here and I can make the PowerPoints available on the existence, consent, and substantive validity questions. We've already looked at that. Uh, so, uh, New York Convention Article 2 contains no rules on the law applicable to determining whether the parties have consented to arbitration. And Article 2.3 does not provide a rule for determining what law uh, governs on the question of substantive validity. Uh, so on consent existence, your law is outside the New York Convention. It's contract law, uh, exclusivity. And I think you can argue that the New York Convention does as well, uh, because it says if they've agreed to arbitrate, you shall go uh, to arbitration. Uh, but you can certainly draft clauses that remove you from the presumption in either one of those cases. So uh, consent, two types of validity, scope, and ex exclusivity. All are going to be questions. Be aware of the governing law, the resulting rule that comes out of each governing law, and if you're drafting the clause, the words you need, and that's the difficult part for the contract drafter. Uh, now, final comments, the role of the CISG. Uh, consent, okay? Consent is a matter of contract formation. Uh, if the CISG is the default law, that's where you'll find it. If it's a chosen law, that's where you're likely uh, to find it. The question is, can the chosen law overrule an, an otherwise applicable uh, default law uh, with the CISG? And the answer is different in different legal systems. Under the Rome 1 Convention, the answer is, in the Rome 1 Regulation in the EU, the answer is clearly yes. Uh, substantive validity, uh, here, uh, it, it's a matter of national law. You've got to look for it outside of uh, the CISG, and it's certainly outside of arbitration law, but it's usually a rule of substantive law. But here's the question for you, although you're making the best mood procedure argument. Can you use procedural law, arbitration law, to get to what is otherwise a rule of substantive law, or to set up an argument for a rule of substantive law, because you may have to do that. Uh, and if you look at uh, the CISG Article 4, what about uh, formal validity and substantive validity? It says, except as otherwise expressly provided in the convention, it is not concerned with the validity of the contract. But we, you do have uh, Articles 8 and 9 uh, that deal with interpretation. Can you, like with scope and exclusivity, argue that validity is in part a question of interpretation 
as well. And if you can, can you then wrap in CISG articles eight and nine? Uh, so, uh, final comment, uh, CISG, uh, I think is a wonderful, fair, good uh, system of law. Uh, it's been incredibly effective in a lot of areas. Uh, it has been excluded uh, by lawyers almost automatically in too many cases. Uh, what is the test of success? I think that's yet to come. I think a new generation of lawyers can make a huge uh, difference on that. But finally, when, when you break it down, start with, start with the basic questions. Uh, and, and with a choice of forum clause, there are the five basic questions. Ask yourself what law tell, answers the question and who applies that law that I hope should help you get to the result. Thank you for your attention.